As some of you know, this particular series that I'm doing this year, I'm alternating between what we think of as um, our standard talent management issues with what I'm referring to as the economics series, where every other month I'm taking a look at something related to emotional intelligence and how that impacts our leadership our management uh, and the talent within our organizations. And I have been starting my presentations this year with a thank you to all those people who have been working extremely hard uh, to enable us to have a safe space uh, in the various services that have been going on while we've been dealing with this pandemic. So it is truly um, an act that all of us should have of gratitude for um, what these people have done and how they've enabled us to uh, move forward in a safe environment. To some of you I'm new, uh, I have been around in this industry for um, quite a long time and all of the work that I've been involved in in the different kinds of products that I've been a part of have been designed to help individuals learn and grow and be effective in the work that they do. And of course, for the last 25 years, I've been working in a variety of environments around the role of emotional intelligence and how emotional intelligence impacts um, our work, our teams, uh, our leadership uh, initiatives. I make an offer to those who attend my economics, economics series, and that is if you'll send me an email with a mailing address, I will send to you free uh, some of my EQ related supporting materials where we cover the basic emotions and have a series of activities that individuals can uh, use to help expand their awareness of emotional intelligence and ways in which emotional intelligence can be um, quite uh, important to the work that each and every one of us do. For the rest of the year, in case you want to continue on my economics um, series, in June, I'm going to take a look at empathy. Uh, and as, I, as you know, I've built this year on music that I very much enjoy and has a particular theme that's relevant to the points that I want to cover. In August, we're going to take a look at stress hardiness. And in October, understanding, processing, and utilizing emotions uh, as a part of uh, this series for the rest of the year. Now, in the next month, and I'll talk a little more about that later, I'm going to take a look at the notion of what it is we need to do to find, acquire, and keep talent in this COVID stress-oriented age uh, that we're in. Uh, I, I uh, every time I hear this particular song from Elton John, I, I have a bit of a private smile because uh, Elton John was one of the first concerts that I went to see when I was uh, uh, an 18 year old and um, very much enjoyed what a performer he was and is, of course, in this particular song as I was thinking about the role of apologies and the role uh, and the nature of apology uh, when we're working with other people, uh, it really came clear to me two lines in the song, sorry seems to be the hardest word, and given the fact that a lot of apologies are needed and so few do, um, it leads naturally to the question of can we talk it over? And in fact, uh, there are a couple of things I'm going to suggest as we get into this material today that you might think about. <clears throat> Now, if you haven't located the chat box, uh, just know that I'm going to ask you to put some things in the chat space as we go through this particular uh, topic today. And as I said in the uh, thematic focus uh, on the web page, if you register, when you register to this, that I really was looking at the nature of trust and the linkage between the quality of our relationships and especially when it comes to um, communicating acceptance and openness, uh, which is, in fact, what an apology will, will do. 
So when we get into this, we're going to look at this at a couple of levels, and I hope you'll find it a prompting, uh, perhaps some fresh thoughts and ways to think about uh, what's important in our uh, relationships and the kinds of things we can do to be more intentionally um, emotionally intelligent. Now, whenever I talk about emotional intelligence, I, I don't make the assumption that we're all on the same page. So I find it necessary to do what I call a little backstage conversation, meaning all of us who are in this professional community have read a lot of stuff on emotional intelligence. Um, I have uh, been looking at the line of literature and research on this for quite some time. And there's some things that I think are really important to put out there whenever we're thinking about emotional intelligence. And just a couple of them, I believe, are quite relevant to uh, the conversation for today. I honestly believe that if you took all of the key research, especially um, in juried research articles that cover everything from uh, the journals on neuroscience and emotions to uh, a host of uh, behavioral studies. Uh, at, at, if you take a look at the research using various EQ related tools, what you'll find is that all of it can be grouped into these sort of big clusters. And at the heart of all of them is emotional literacy. And I'll say a little more about that in, in just a minute. But you can't really get to emotional intelligence without having a good grasp of what emotional literacy is and what it's all about. And in fact, the very first scientific study of emotional literacy was, was done by Charles Darwin when he wrote a piece entitled Expression of Emotions in Animals and Humans. And it is a brilliant accounting of how emotions are expressed and the role those emotions serve in the way a human being or an animal manages their social environment. Um, in the last, I would say, certainly uh, uh, 40 years, the evolution of the idea of certain capabilities related to emotional intelligence has been forwarded by Mayer and Salovey and Caruso uh, their particular tool, uh, the Mesquite, the Mayer Salovey Caruso Emotional Intelligence Test, is the only performance based EQ instrument in the market. Uh, Mayer and Salovey, and then later Caruso, who joined that team, have gained a great deal of credibility in the research and, and in the, I might say, even the standard sort of psychological research circles on the capabilities related to emotions and, and how emotions can be managed. Um, they suffer from the same problem that all intelligent models suffer from, and that is the limitations of the relationship between the capability and predicting performance. The, the whole notion of personality surveys and personality patterns, uh, you'll find in the literature a great deal of brouhaha of people who say, look, all you need to understand is personality factors if you really and truly want to get a handle on uh, how to be more emotionally, interpersonally effective. And as I've made note, this is a much debated uh, argument, but those who've invested a lot in their personality tools um, are happy to uh, make this point and have good points to be made about certain factors and EQ. And of course, there's the general notion of, well, at the end of the day, where the rubber meets the road is human behavior. Um, what are our cognitions and our expressions of behavior that impact how we uh, respond both to our emotional makeup as well as the emotional reactions of others? Now, um, I, I, uh, I have put in a very intentionally up front and central the notion of the rules of emotion with this statement. It is just not true if someone says, you made me feel, <laughs> because that just can't be. 
the feelings or emotions that an individual has is based entirely on their own makeup and their own psychology. Individuals do things, we perceive things, we hear things which trigger in us emotional reactions. But the notion of saying you made me feel implies that I give over my power and my psychology to you as opposed to acknowledging, gosh, I'm having a reaction, a particular emotional reaction to something that's transpired. And what does that mean? What does that say in my own psychology that's at play? We know that we generate our emotions. We know that they are very much affected by our mind maps. I'm sure many of you have seen and read the studies of how emotions um, the same event triggers different emotional reactions in, in folks. Uh, and when you get to talking to them, you discover that there's a different map in their head about this particular behavior that they're reacting to. And of course, ultimately, if we're going to be emotionally intelligent uh, about our own emotions, we need to be asking ourselves, well, gosh, what prompted my emotional reaction the way it was? What do I need to learn What's the message um, that my emotions are trying to give me? And ultimately, that's what emotional literacy is all about. <clears throat> How do I name and define the emotion? How does the emotion show up? How is it blended with other reactions that I'm having? Um, and in fact, am I seeing in others similar emotional reactions? And what might that mean in terms of my relationship with them? Now, if you dig into the research on emotions, you'll find that in terms of emotional literacy, there are very often um, clear meanings associated with emotional reaction. So, for example, when people get angry and, and later when they cool off and you ask them, well, what prompted the anger? It almost always is about a sense of a violation of some form, a violation of an agreement. Um, a perceived barrier has gotten in the way, someone's gotten in the way of achieving a particular thing. Um, and in fact, uh, often when people feel judged incorrectly, again, it's by a perceived violation of, of a expectation or contract between, even if unspoken, between individuals. So we know through all kinds of analyses that emotions, uh, when we unpack them, carry messages. I often think emotions really are the first human language uh, and it happens to be a language to ourselves about our reactions to the environment that we're in. Uh, some folks, Plutich, uh, did a particular emotional will and that piece has been around a long time and is used to help people be aware of the terms they use um, on those different uh, emotional reactions. If we look at the Mayor Salovey and others who've done parallel studies, we see that there are several kinds of capabilities around perceiving emotions. Likewise, there are several kinds of capabilities uh, related to how people analyze or judge their emotions. And we all know that emotions color our perceptions and our judgments and are threaded. I think it was Emerson who called emotions the iron wire that runs through human experience. And by that, he meant that it was in fact so much a part of how we experience things um, that you can't, you can't just simply dispense it with it easily. Now to the personality material that's out there, you'll find that there are very often um, uh, studies that say, look, if you use the Hogan, for example, or the CPI or the workplace big five or the NEO, or the 16 PF, here are the ways in which you can reconfigure those scales to be attuned to how emotions are driving some of the behaviors and the ways in which you can learn to manage them um, more effectively. Multiple folks, when they try to pull it all together, say something like this. At the end of the day, EQ really has to do with various skills that enable us to recognize our impulses, our emotional reactions, our moods, to be able to read those situations and the emotional elements of what's going on 
in our interactions or circumstances that we're in and respond uh, most appropriately to find a constructive way forward in the relationships. I'm always curious <clears throat> when I get into a topic and I'm exploring a particular aspect of um, a facet of emotional intelligence and certainly trustworthiness is one of those and really runs through the rest of what we're going to explore today. I'm curious in your mind, when you think about making sure you're building trustworthiness with others, what would you say is the kind of behavior that you demonstrate or you see others demonstrate that uh, helps build trustworthiness? um in uh your relationships or relationships with others just a simple behavior that in your mind uh either one that you know you're working on or one that you've seen others do that you think really helps build the kind of trustworthy um climate especially in the work setting authenticity and vulnerability behaviors match intent good intention Vulnerability, yeah. Following up, circling back, yeah. Often people will say, I can trust a person who follows up even if I don't like <laughs> maybe what they're coming back to me with. Uh, I do trust that they're giving me the, the um, information as it is. Do what you say you're going to do. That often comes up as a, a message of, of being a trustworthy person. And part of that is also letting the person know when something isn't going to happen the way you thought it was going to happen. Um, all right, so ask. Yeah, realizing that I may not be reading the emotions accurately. So in fact, it's just worthwhile to ask. In fact, I do believe that's very important. Asking that open-ended question about how are you feeling? Uh, what's your reaction? Um, help me understand your take on this. Yeah, assuming that others are capable. And actually, um, these comments that you're making, we're going to come back to in a, in a very particular way in the next part. I do fundamentally believe that when it comes to these kinds of topics, EQ skills and EQ capabilities really helps us address the trust and trustworthiness issues um, that exist and permeate organizational life. And it really follows in my mind to the responsibility of the manager or the leader to pay attention to the trust climate um, in an operation. There, there was a recent uh, research report published in, um, um, this one was in a uh, APA uh, journal, I believe it was, right. Uh, it, you'll notice, and I've highlighted, there's extensive literature suggesting apologies are effective in repairing trust. Um, the notion, I'm sorry, even about the rain, even though I have no control over that, increases the perception of interpersonal trust between people. The notion that uh, if you look at threads around apologies, um, it does appear to be the case that the effort to apologize for a circumstance, a situation, even if you didn't have direct control over it, helps build a more constructive relationship or a sense of, of uh, um, trust in working with others. I'm curious <clears throat> if you think about examples of effective apologies. Man, this could be real big public examples. It could be something you've observed uh, inside of the work that you do. What's the particular kind of apology or effective apology um, that you've seen that uh, has caught your attention? And you find that even if it's a, you've seen it on a video somewhere, every time you see it, you, you have this sense of gratitude that the person or the organization expressed the apology. So I'm just curious. And of course, what was the behavior that made the apology so effective? And an apology without a rationalization, no qualifiers.
an acknowledgement of the impact. Not making light of the situation, no explanation, none of the buts, in other words, which can be, of course, uh, disruptive of a real serious apology. You know, it's kind of interesting. I went looking and I do this. I go looking in the literature. What's the most uh, recent article I can find on a topic? And Forbes, it's because of its influence in the business world, uh, actually did an article on the most powerful apologies or the most effective apologies that have come from businesses on a variety of issues in the last couple of years. And it was a fascinating article. Um, and they identified the ones that I think have been very public. I went looking for the video of an apology that occurred oh, about a decade ago and I couldn't find it. It, it was extraordinary. Um, it was, I believe, in Tokyo when the president of um, an airline was apologizing to the family members of uh, uh, of the deceased from an airplane crash. And it was an absolutely spellbounding apology that he gave to the group. But the thing that was so incredibly powerful is um, how when people were asking him questions, how he responded and uh, when people wanted to get up to him, he pushed away the security guard so that he could be right there with the individuals. Very powerful. Um, interaction that seemed very sincere and vulnerable um, as as a CEO. So these are the ones that Forbes uh, indicates and ones that we've seen, I'm sure. But I suspect the apologies that we might need to be attentive to have more to do with our everyday micro interactions in organizations between managers and other managers, managers and vendors and managers and direct reports and leaders um, with all of those in an organization. And some of you may have read, it's published now some years ago, I want to say not 2016, um, the Robert Sutton book, The No Asshole Rule. And he, you, you may know the story of that book. He, had published an article in the Harvard Business Review entitled The Cost of Difficult People. And he apologized ahead of time and asked the editor for permission to use asshole in the article. And they gave him permission. And what he didn't realize was the tsunami of emails that came in that said, let me tell you about the asshole in my organization. And out of all those emails, I mean, literally thousands of them, he began to use that as a kind of experiment to see what are the trends, themes, and patterns and produced this very interesting book. And what he said was, you know, when people feel humiliated or de-energized or belittled, or people feel less powerful as a result of an interaction that occurs or diminished in some way, uh, there has been a kind of a betrayal of regard, respect, and that bruise actually is perhaps worthy when you're aware of it, of an apology. I find that uh, most folks, and whenever I say this, some people sort of, you know, I can't believe he said that, but I honestly, 90 to 95% of the managers, leaders, executives that I've worked with in my career are people who have been working hard to do the right thing. Um, they have been passionate about doing the right thing. Um, they haven't always done it in the most elegant way. And they haven't always done it, uh, in, if you will, in an emotionally intelligent way. But I have seen very, very few managers and executives and leaders who seem to me intention intentionally setting out to diminish, demean, and disempower others. I think by this point in time, both, most managers and executives understand um, that, you know, if you want to get big things done, if you want to achieve great things, you need a team 
that in fact um, is really on board with you and they're not going to be on board with you if they feel diminished in some way. In 2017, uh, the retiring editor of the business section of the New York Times published an article on his over 500 interviews with CEOs and one of the things he found uh, threaded through the most successful CEOs was their high regard for and desire to communicate their respect to those who uh, worked in the organization to help make things happen. And yet, in spite of what I've just said, survey after survey shows that in the workplace, trust feels broken. Uh, that it, it varies greatly. There is uh, evidence from multiple sources that say uh, that people do not feel as though they are in a space, a trustful space, where there's a trustworthy relationship with their manager or even in some cases with their co-workers. Now, I have a hypothesis about this <clears throat> and it really comes down to attending to three basic human needs. Uh, if we um, pay attention to decades of research about the needs that individuals have, uh, Will Schutz distilled it down to three things. He said in interactions, all of us are wired to listen for and get some sense of whether or not we are seen as significant in this interaction. We are wired and it happens in nanoseconds to read whether or not we are seen as competent. That in fact, our capabilities are recognized. And we are listening ever so closely for in the tone and in the way in which a person orients themselves to us, the message of worthwhile, which comes across with openness and warmth. And my hunch is that whenever we don't attend to those three and a person walks away from the interaction, they may feel in some way diminished. And as I've thought about this, and, and I've thought about this over the years and working with all kinds of people, what's clear is we are wired differently and the same. <laughs> We're wired differently in that we have different levels of needs of these particular messages in our interactions with others. Some of us are happy just to have a, hey, how you doing? Some of us need to not only have a, hey, how you're doing, but a full stop and engagement that says, I am paying attention to you. You are the focus of my attention. Some of us are happy to hear the boss say or a peer say, I appreciated that piece you did yesterday when you presented X, Y, Z. And some of us need to know that that's also recognized, but a whole host of other things are known and recognized by those especially in power in an organization. And then sometimes a simple message of how you're doing is a sufficient indication of worth and others feel that there's worth communicated when we are willing to disclose to one another. We're willing to say, I'm feeling X, Y, Z. and How are you feeling in this particular way? I find it interesting that, it, it, and I do believe Schutz was onto something quite significant, that when we pay attention to these three messages in our micro interactions with people and recognize that we need to find out how much of attention and energy that people need, uh, we in fact can uh, address what could be unintentional disregard messages that produce unintentional disempowerment. I really believe fundamentally that most offenses are unintentional and because they're not initially seen, because I, I believe these are more micro moments, it, it's sort of a, a, thou, a, 
a death by a thousand cuts, um, that we need to up our ability to read others' reactions, that we need to listen more generously to what other people are trying to message to us. And it isn't just listening for content, it's listening for emotional climate, it's listening for degrees of intensity and asking. And when someone is willing to be vulnerable enough to say, you know, yesterday when we were talking and you abruptly ended the conversation, I felt that you weren't really interested. And I, I, I just want you to know that. When we're willing to say, gosh, I'm so sorry. I, I really was caught up. I've got in my own head about this. It is my mistake. Um, let, let, please, let's talk about that so that in the future, if I fall in that same space, that you let me know right away. Because I, I, it's not my intent to disempower you in the interaction. There was a fascinating set of research pieces where the researchers uh, took a look at how trustworthiness and trust-related behavior and negative emotions and apologies were related. Uh, and it, there was a tight relationship in these analysis about the fact that by uh, making an apology where there had been some negative emotions, people are able to repair and build trust. A fascinating piece of work and often um, summarized uh, in this particular research piece that was in the Harvard Business Review. And I, I think it's worth paying attention to the statement that the researcher puts in front of us here. To apologize publicly is a high stakes move. And we might ask ourselves, well, gosh, um, maybe there are times when we shouldn't apologize until we fully understand what the situation can be. But we also know not to acknowledge and not to apologize could really be enormously damaging to a relationship. And to apologize uh, in an appropriate way can be a sign of character and to do it in inappropriate ways can in fact be a sign of weakness. In fact, I've heard CEOs say, I'm very careful about apologies because I don't want to appear to be weak. And yet, in those relationships, very often they have, uh, as you might imagine, uh, a variety of trust issues. I thought that, and I put it in red, an apology that is too little, too late, and too transparently tactical can bring an individual or an institution to ruin. And I, I think that's the, the big message that are we attuned enough to know when to apologize, especially for the disempowering message that has unintentionally occurred that we become aware of? Um, and when we do it, we know we're building the kind of trust that we want to have in the organization. Our friend here um, is being quite inauthentic and in being coached to at least show as though you're uh, trying to give a certain message in, in the world. Sherm did a report in 2016 in one of their publications around uh, elements of an apology that seemed to matter. And you said some of this a little bit earlier. You said, um, gosh, expression of regret, explanation of what went wrong, owning what transpired and what occurred, taking responsibility for that and knowing that you were being uh, sorry for what has transpired and to figure out a repair and how it is that we can move forward uh, in uh, this relationship that we, we want to have. So we know that the ways in which to give an apology can have a difference. Now, I'm curious if, if my proposition is right that most of the trust issues that occur in organizations are around these unintended micro interactions where people feel disempowered. And if we, if, we, if we think there could be trust dynamics inside of the organization, what then are some of the consequences you've seen? What are some of the predictable outcomes when trust is not attended to? What do you observe as uh, some of the dynamics that occur when people walk around 
with a low trust level inside of their organization. Yeah, low engagement, demotivation, a lot of people, CYA. Yeah, I probably, I, I suspect we could find some research in the relationship between turnover and uh, measures of trust, organizational trust. Yeah, political environments. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's interesting uh, that you mentioned the word fear, uh, David. Uh, it, it, it's always been interesting to me that um, this issue of fear has been talked about for a long, long time, but we seem to have difficulty grasping how to turn that tide. Um, the notion that fear exists inside of an organization, fear of raising your hand saying, hey, I have a different idea or I, I have a different object, I have an objection to certain things um, can in fact be demobilizing in organizations. Um, some, some folks back in the 50s and 60s said management's number one job is to stamp out fear. Well, we've been having that conversation for 60 years and we still haven't gotten a good handle on that. <clears throat> This particular article by Paul Zak, he, he reports that employees in high trust organizations are more productive, have more energy, collaborate better, and stay with their employers longer um, than those uh, employees in low trust related organizations. And so we know that trust is key and important. And we know that trust doesn't exist when there's a blame culture. And of course, you may have been in organizations where this would precisely occur. The CEO would stand up and declare it's a blame culture and it's so-and-so's fault, now, rather than taking a look at oneself about how um, they have contributed to that culture. <clears throat> uh, Zach included his particular piece in the Harvard Business Review and again reaffirms all the things that we've said uh, about the, the how disempowerment and low trust impacts organizations and individuals um, being productive and feeling as though they they're making a difference. In a recent article in Sherm's uh, standard monthly publication, there was a piece that said, you know, there's a way trust gets destroyed. It gets destroyed when you avoid conflict, when promises are broken, which some, some of you mentioned that earlier, where there's an over-focus on compliance rather than um, paying attention to dynamic circumstances, the failure to communicate and, and actually to behave as though trust is assumed when in fact um, it may not be there. And we know organizations do things like we see here in this example, sorry, but we already know who we're going to hire for the new ethics director. We just posted the job for show. It's a sure way to ensure that the narrative in the organization is not going to be uh, a trust related narrative. Now, because I've been interested in this issue for some time and the differences between trustworthy and trusting um, are kind of fascinating when you start looking at the research and you try to understand what does being trustworthy mean. Um, and in a piece that I did with some colleagues called the People Skills Handbook, we talk about trustworthy is behaving in a way such that a large and diverse circle of people respond to you with belief and confidence. That they believe you, they believe that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And there are certain benchmark behaviors that, that are almost always present in high trustworthy situations. The notion of embracing differences harkens back to my comment earlier about how we're wired differently. 
um, and how paying attention to that different wiring really does matter. Um, when we take a look at uh, how we communicate and people do want to be a part of making decisions, we never want to hear this message. We want to include you in this decision without letting you affect it. Well, that's a sure way to shoot trusting and trustworthiness inside of an organization to give that message that uh, what you bring to the table is not worthwhile. So being trusting and being trustworthy have different elements to it. That's my only point. And we want to be both as managers and leaders, trusting, believing in others and demonstrate and behave in ways so that people find us trustworthy. Um, and in the trusting list of things, the one that I would highlight would be the way in which we, dis we demonstrate confidence in others um, and in their willingness to work toward constructive goals. I find that one to be uh, by far one of the more powerful kinds of behaviors that managers and leaders demonstrate. And this is a repeat of what I shared just a little bit ago. Now, I'm curious, in your experience, how you would answer King Arthur's question to Sir Lancelot. Can crack trust be mended? Now, I've talked about the big trust issues and organizational circumstances. I've talked about little trust issues in terms of our daily interactions. What have you seen that works in building trust back? What enables us to mend the crack when people feel betrayed or feel that it's not a trusting environment or that their manager or leader is not trustworthy. Um, what, what is it that we need to do to mend, if it can be mend, mended? That question, by the way, comes from the last piece of work by John Steinbeck you know, that was published after his death on King Arthur and his Noble Knights. And it's in a dialogue that that happens where Arthur says to Lancelot, can crack trust be mended? And the rest of the book explores that and comes to the conclusion that not really. We might have a different answer. You've said things like acknowledge that it's cracked and how, how do we work together to solve it? Uh, being authentically vulnerable and extend a fresh expression of trust uh, in the capability of others. Yeah, interesting. You know, at the end of the day, um, yeah, acknowledge the betrayal, explain it with humility, uh, your understanding of it with humility, and you be asked for the opportunity to show uh, difference. Yeah. Uh, being aware matters, right? Those are the kinds of things we might do to help mend uh, a broken trust between us and another person or us and a group, or encourage leaders that we may be coaching to do um, when their environment is uh, cracked, if you will, trust-wise. And there are times when it's important to have a realistic view to say, um, this situation is so uh, devastatingly disruptive that we need to make wholesale changes. Uh, that, that there's something a manager or leader that's done. I know I've coached some in the past where they have done something so profoundly uh, betrayal, such a profound betrayal to people in the organization that the only thing that would help both mend the organization and help this person is for that person to move to another uh, setting, another organizational setting in most cases. So we would prefer uh, to deal with the situation and to mend the trust, crack trust in a particular relationship when at all possible. Well, it won't surprise you that as I have thought about this issue, um, it becomes really important to think about how does this impact 
uh, the languaging and the approach that Bob Eichinger and I have taken in talking about the behaviors that matter inside of the levels in an organization. Uh, some of you know Bob Eichinger and I have uh, taken a look at what are the kinds of roles and behaviors that a person at the top of the organization needs to be engaged in and what about in the middle, middle managers and supervisors and individual contributors. And of course, we all know that trust relationships on teams, really those relationships must be trusting if the team is ever going to be a high performing team. And so as I thought about it and I begin to ask this question of how in fact would uh, focusing on trust, focusing on building a more trustworthy uh, set of relationships impact um, the libraries, I began to take a look at our definitions and our behaviors and said, gosh, you know what? It is a rather significant factor in the way it impacts and the way it threads through uh, our, our libraries. And when you start looking at the behaviors, the behaviors address a lot of the various issues um, that you mentioned earlier um, that both we need to pay attention to to build trust and trustworthiness and to pay attention to to strengthen relationships regardless of the level you're at within the organization. So um, I, I was uh, quite, um, I try to approach these things almost as if you will, uh, I can have a, a beginner's mind. What is it? that this factor means as it pulls through and did we cover the territory when we uh, wrote the supporting material and I felt uh, feel very good about the fact that we did that as you take a look at individual contributors or managers or leaders or teams um, you will find threaded through what we believe are the core behaviors that folks need to engage in at those different levels to boost the trust environment and to boost the, the kind of setting um, that people will find satisfying. So I hope that you found this particular look at um, uh, a little bit of emotional intelligence as we dallied some around the power of our messaging and certainly our unintended messages at times and how those unintended messages can erode trust and eroded trust uh, has all kinds of negative outcomes in an organization. Next month, um, we'll take a look at finding, landing, and keeping talent. And then, of course, as I've already alerted you in June, we'll take a look at the next economics topic um, where empathy is going to be the focus of that particular work.